appreciate Daniel for leading us in those songs. And he's certainly right. We need to remember the love of God as we think about this study of the eldership and consider appointing another elder who is qualified to serve in this capacity. God's love is seen in all things that we're doing here this morning. And it's been so enriching to be with you and to study his word and think about his will for us and to be able to edify one another. We want our visitors to know that you're certainly appreciated in your presence. We want you to know that you're an honored guest, and we certainly love you back in any other opportunity that you might have. If you have any questions about what we've done or said here this morning, we would be a friend to discuss those with you. We certainly want to be so, so don't hesitate to ask so that we can study God's Word together. We have began to study in the first hour about the eldership as we consider a man, Scott Ward, being put forward to be considered to be appointed as an elder of this congregation, serving alongside the ones that we already have. And we have considered that as God's will. It is certainly His will that local congregations would have aged men who are experienced, who are really the ideal Christian, and when we get into these qualifications, I want us to be aware of that. They're, they're held to a high standard, but that standard is still the gospel of Christ, and so we're all to be possessors of these qualities and characteristics. The difference is that not all Christians do live like they should live, and so lest one be appointed to leadership who is not leading what, like they live, or like, like the scripture tells them to live, God has made these qualifications, and no one is to be appointed who does not meet these qualifications. But we are to work toward this spiritual maturity. The elders are those who have, through their life, exhibited such a consistency of faith and righteousness and holiness, and are those who we can follow as an example, are those who know the Word of God and have proven character, to follow it, to enforce it, and are therefore fit by the will of God to serve in that capacity. We noticed first and foremost that that is, of course, according to the Lord's will. When we speak about elders, when we speak about their importance, when we speak about the qualifications when we get to that, we need to realize that this is all specified by divine language by divine revelation. This is God telling us what His blueprint for the church is. It is God who dictates what His church looks like. Christ built it, purchased it, and is its head. And on the local level is the organization of the bishops and the deacons. And so when there are qualified men, we must appoint them or else we are unscripturally unorganized. We notice those possibilities as well of organization. Then we looked at the titles given for the elders. And this is extremely important because what they do and what all titles do is describe the work and action of the person who holds that title. So the president presides over the country, has authority, looks over the country and governs in that way. And so an elder is really, as I think I skipped over this, but Vine says this about the term presbyteros, which is for elder. Uh, We noticed that it was an adjective describing an older man. He says that the term elder indicates the mature spiritual experience and understanding of those so described. The term bishop or overseer indicates the character of the work undertaken. And so... Elders are aged men who are mature in the faith, but they are not just older men who are mature in the faith. They're older men who are mature in the faith and have been appointed to this office of authority, of leadership. And so elder helps us understand that they are older, experienced, knowledgeable, that they're not a novice, that they have developed the Christ-like characteristics that all Christians are to develop, but they've proven that they have that characteristic, that they have... Uh, the age that is great enough to be married and to have children who have themselves come to obey the Lord, they have showed that leadership. And so age with age comes experience. But then we noticed the other word as well, bishop and overseer. And if you need these charts, they're online. My my whole outline I'll put online as well. Uh, But we covered this in the 9 o'clock hour. 
bishop, an overseer, episkopos, is another term. And it has to do with one who is uh, superintending, that is overseeing uh, an organization that is certainly the superintendent or overseer of the church as they have met those qualifications. And make no mistake about it, the overseers, the elders of a congregation, do indeed have authority. They're not figureheads. And so don't be deceived by yourself or others into thinking that, well, elders, you know, they're just kind of so we can say that we have leaders. It's for tax purposes. It's for for our building. Their names are on the deed or whatever it may be that, that it's those kinds of really insignificant things. They have authority. They don't dictate God's word. God does that, but they enforce it. And certainly there will be matters of judgment that God has not dictated, matters of liberty like we meet at 9, 10, and 11 on Sunday morning. Some congregations meet at 9 and 10 and then 6 in the evening. Well, that was up to the elders to make the decision based on what they saw was most expedient, helpful for the service of the Lord in this congregation. Now, here's the thing. They have the authority to do that. But their authority is not to be abused for their own advantage or benefit or purposes. So those kinds of choices are also by virtue of their estimation of what would be best for this congregation. We need to understand that. And so while there may be some judgments made by the elders that someone might not agree entirely with, maybe you thought that a decision could be made a different way, but it's not a matter of doctrine. It's not a matter of what Scripture dictates. It is our responsibility to submit to their rule. They have rule. But they are not to abuse that rule. We talked about that as well. They have oversight to ensure that things are done according to the pattern decently and in order for our edification and that the members maintain faithfulness and they have the authority to administer discipline. It is called church discipline. But think about this for a moment. In Matthew, the 18th chapter, there's a pattern of personal sin where Jesus talks about one who has sinned personally against you. You and him only know it. You go to him, and if you've gained your brother, you've gained your brother. But if not, take two or three witnesses. But eventually it reaches the point where if he's not even willing to hear them, take it to the church. Well, what would that look like? Does the church stand up and they speak together, or are there leaders of the congregation that would uh, allow that communication to be orderly and information to flow well, to know the problem, to judge well of the problem, and then lead in administering the church Discipline And Lord willing, sometime in the not-too-distant future, we'll be studying from uh, that particular topic as, as well. Not promising a date, but that is an important topic. The elders have a lot to do with that. And then we looked at the word pastor or shepherd. And it literally means a shepherd of sheep, but obviously figuratively and metaphorically, it stands to represent the description of the work of this man who is an elder and overseer feeding the sheep, feeding the Christians here, the souls here, uh, guarding the sheep, protecting the sheep. And it brings to us, with any familiarity of, of the Old and New Testament about shepherds, the understanding of tender and loving care for the sheep, of the provision and guidance based on the love that one has for the sheep, being willing to lay down life for the sheep. And so he's a man who has developed love for the congregation and has exhibited love throughout his life as a Christian to the degree that the Bible requires and is going to, therefore, with that proven character, be willing to stand up in difficult situations and administer discipline and defend the congregation from error and sin and division and maintain unity in the spirit and the bond of peace. A shepherd of the flock. And before we get to the qualifications, I want to just reemphasize that this is a very serious study and situation. It always needs to be taken with the gravity that it inherently possesses. And so we need to be careful about our understanding of these qualifications and about the men that are being um, put forward to be appointed as elders and make sure that we are appointing faithful and qualified men, but it is not a room for opinions. It's not room for getting on your soapbox and voicing your agendas. It's not room for personal quarrels. And so maybe there is a man who is put forward, just speaking generally, 
that someone had a run-in with 20 years ago. And for some reason, you just can't swallow that bitterness and get over it. But there is the reconciliation in that degree. Any sin is not there anymore. And, and so it's just really a personal matter. You just don't like the guy. Well, that's a problem you need to solve. But it has no place for considering whether he is faithful and qualified as an elder. This is not a time for division and strife and contention but a time for unity in the Spirit as we consider God's qualifications of the man. It is a time for rejoicing and thanksgiving, as Daniel was talking about before he led us in those songs, that God has been wise enough and gracious enough to bless us with an infallibly structured institution that He divinely ordained in the church and that we are given those men who have been living their life according to the Scripture and therefore can serve as an example and as an authority and as a guide in spiritual matters. We thank God that He has given us this structure, but we need to make sure that we glorify Him by understanding it and applying it and submitting to it accordingly. So before we get into the qualifications, and by no means will this be an in-depth or detailed study of them, there have been books written series of lessons preached, and we're going to have a cursory study of them. But I hope it suffices for the purpose of the hour. But before we get into those qualifications, I think we need to understand the nature of the qualifications. When we use the word qualification, we're not using a word that is found specifically in Scripture. But before you get all upset about that and worried about that, when you speak about Bible things in Bible ways, you know Bible's not in the New Testament either. Bible is not a word found in the Bible. But we use it because it is descriptive of a library of books that God has inspired. It's the Holy Bible. We've been studying about that before as well. When you speak about apostasy, apostasy is not a word found in the Scripture. But the description of drifting away is representative of what apostasy indicates. You could say the same thing with a number of words that we use. We certainly need to use Bible language, but also when we use a word to describe something in Scripture that fits that situation, it is certainly good and proper. And qualification is one of those words. We'll see why. The New Oxford American Dictionary defines qualification as a quality or accomplishment that makes someone suitable for a particular job or activity. Emphasize the word particular job or activity. When we're thinking about the qualifications, we think about them in the context of the work that is qualifying the man for. And so these are qualities. These are accomplishments, if you will. This is marks of spiritual growth that shows this man is fit to serve in the capacity of an elder of a bishop or overseer, of a pastor or shepherd. And I want us to notice the nature of that in 1 Timothy 3. In verse 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 3, you see the qualifications of elders begin. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1 says, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. And then he goes on the list of the qualifications. Notice in verse 1, he says, if a man, that's important. If he does not desire it, he fails at that first qualification. You must desire the office. First Peter 5 talks about how they must serve, not by compulsion, but willingly. It must not be something they are doing reluctantly, but out of love for God and the flock and willingly in service of the good of these people. Then notice in verse 2, a bishop then must be. Those are very strong words. Must is the Greek word day. It means, as Thayer defines it, it is necessary. There is need of it. It behooves. It is right and proper. It is a necessity in reference to what is required to attain some end. That is no ifs, ands, or buts about that must. It is a requirement. It is a necessity. And so you think of the word qualification, it makes someone suitable for a particular job. These show he is suitable for this job. Therefore, if he does not have these that are a must, he is not suitable. But notice the word be, which is the Greek word 
ane, and it means, Strong says, to exist. And it, in this text, is in the present active form. And so there are necessities, requirements, no wiggle room there, that must exist presently and actively within the man before he is appointed. That's important. And so I alluded to in the first lesson that there are some who believe that there is qualification through trial, so you appoint the man as an elder who is not meeting all the qualifications and pray that he will grow in that capacity until he has the qualifications while he is learning the ropes, if you will, and performing the work and functioning in the office of the eldership. That is not what we read here in 1 Timothy 3 and verses 1 and 2. We read this man meets all the qualifications that are listed by the Holy Spirit presently and actively before he is acknowledged as an elder. That's important. That's important. The very nature, though, of the term qualification requires our consideration of these items in the list within the context of the work, as I mentioned. They are suitable for a particular job. And so that's especially important when we think about the domestic qualifications, which we by no means will get into very much detail about. There are many conflicts that surround those particular qualifications, but it's important for us to remember These qualifications are qualifying this man for this spiritual work of overseeing and shepherding a spiritual flock of souls with the Word of God to serve Him faithfully and acceptably. And these should be understood and interpreted in that context. I want us to notice, though, in Acts chapter 20 and in verse 28, something about the language of that passage. In Acts chapter 20 and in verse 28, we read this earlier, Paul tells the Ephesian elders, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Notice that he says the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But the Holy Spirit is a divine person. There are three persons that share the divine nature, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, God made these men overseers. Now, how did He make them overseers? In Ephesians 6 and in verse 17, we read that the sword of the Spirit, the Spirit's instrument, what He does, what He wields to do His job, what He brings to the table, insofar as our salvation is concerned, is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And so when the Holy Spirit makes a man an elder, an overseer, He makes that man an elder and overseer by the revealed qualifications in His Word. The Holy Spirit wrote 1 Timothy 3. The Holy Spirit wrote Titus 1. The Holy Spirit is making that elder, is qualifying that elder. It also is to be understood in regard to the fact that these are older men who are mature in the faith, transformed by the Gospel. In Galatians chapter 5, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. As they follow the Spirit's teaching, they are bearing this fruit. The Spirit is doing that through His teaching. If we live in the Spirit, verse 25, let us also walk in the Spirit. And so by revealing the qualifications that this man is exhibiting, and by living the Christian life as dictated by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit makes qualified men. That's important. And so to that end, we need to understand the nature of the appointment as well. Essentially, you have a man who lives his life to the greatest degree he can by the will of God. And because of that, he is transformed by the Spirit to be a mature Christian. And a mature Christian exhibits all of these qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 and of Titus chapter 1. That's a representation of a mature Christian who is worthy to follow as an example as he imitates Christ. And when such a man fits these qualifications... And that is observed by the people of God. And he has the desire to serve in the capacity of an elder. Then no man, woman or child, discerns and makes the decision ultimately that they are going to appoint that man or not appoint that man. Our job is by observation to see who God is saying should serve as an elder. That's important. Our job is to observe. God makes the elder, we observe it and acknowledge it by appointment. That's important. 
In Acts the 14th chapter and in verse 23, when Paul is on his first missionary journey and they're revisiting churches, it says that they had appointed elders in every church and they prayed and fasted and commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. I want us to notice he says that they had appointed elders in every church. The Greek word for appointed, as it's translated, means to stretch forth the hands, literally, from a compound word meaning the hand and then to stretch, to stretch forth the hands. This is what Art and Gingrich says of the word. That might be small, I'm sorry, but I will try to read it clearly. Art and Gingrich says of this word that means to stretch forth the hand, that it was used to mean to elect or choose someone for definite offices or tasks. He says, on the other hand, elders in Lyconia and Pisidia, referring to this passage of Acts 14 and verse 23, were not chosen by the congregations, but it is said of Paul and Barnabas that they appointed elders in every church. This does not involve a choice by the group, Here the word means appoint, install with the apostles as subjects. That is extremely important. The congregation did not cast their ballot and vote on a man and majority rules. That's not what happened. That's never what happened. What happened was the apostles, inspired of the Holy Spirit, having the guidance of the Holy Spirit to know who is qualified and who is not, saw the men who met the qualifications and appointed them in those churches. That's important. Now you might wonder, how are we going to do that if we don't have apostles today? Well, for the same reason we have the apostles' doctrine. We have the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit's work. And so Acts 20 and verse 28 says similarly, I'm sorry, here uh, Vine says there that it means by recognition of those who had been manifesting themselves as gifted of God to discharge the function of elders. And so they showed they were qualified and they knew that by the revelation of the inspired apostles. But in Acts 20, verse 28, what we just read is a similar word that is used in made, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. It means to cause, to undergo a change in experience, condition, to make, consign, with the middle, with the double accusative, to make something. The Holy Spirit has made them such and consigned them to the work of oversight. And so there's the idea of stretching out the hand to to grasp hold of and appoint to place. That's what this word means too, to place, to undergo a change, an experience, a condition, to make, to consign. The Holy Spirit is doing that. In Acts chapter 14, the apostles did that because they were directed by the Holy Spirit being inspired men. That's important. And then lastly, in Titus 1 and verse 5, there's a different word used, but it's synonymous, especially with that in Acts 14, 23. When the apostle Paul tells Titus, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. That word means to set, place, put, to appoint one, to administer an office. And so it's very similar to the words. But in Acts 14, the apostles, inspired of the Spirit, with the Spirit's direction, appointed them. They set them to the work. In Acts 20, the Holy Spirit Himself made them elders, appointed them to the work. And Titus, he's telling Titus, who is a young evangelist, that you appoint elders in every city to set them in place, to appoint one to administer to an office. But I want us to notice a very important phrase there. As I commanded you. That's, that is key. The word as is the Greek word hos. And this is what Art and Gingrich says of that word. A comparative particle marking the manner in which something proceeds. Titus, you appoint these men as elders in this manner. And that is when in verses 6 through 9, he gives the qualifications. As I've commanded you. How did I command you? Well, these men are the qualified men. This is their work. This is how you identify the ones the Holy Spirit is making overseers. In this manner, according to these requisites, according to these qualifications, you appoint them. And so what I'm trying to emphasize here is that when we speak about elders being men being qualified to be elders and them 
being appointed as we've acknowledged their qualification. The Holy Spirit's doing all of it. He's working through men who have studied the Word of God. I mean Christians who have studied the Word of God, who have studied these qualifications, who have understood these qualifications, and are therefore observing them present within a man. And if that man desires the position of an elder, and he is qualified, and we decide, nope, not today. Nope, we don't want you in the eldership. That is a rebellion against the Holy Spirit. It's a rebellion against Christ. It's a rebellion against the apostolic doctrine. It's a rebellion against the commands of apostles. And so qualification and appointment is not up to debate in regard to opinions. Certainly we need to discern what is the will of God and what these qualifications mean and whether a man meets them. It's not up to human wisdom. It's not up to opinion. It's up to the Holy Spirit. And just like we've been studying with the compilation of the Bible, God shows, we observe, and then we follow. And that's what we're doing with this. We determine that they're being qualified for the office based on what the Holy Spirit says that they should look like. There's an example of this in Acts chapter 6. Now, this is an appointment of people to a position of work. This is not talking about deacons or elders, but it is something that provides a decent example. In Acts chapter 6, they had a daily distribution of the, con, uh, of the collection for needy saints. And there were Hellenists, that is Greek-speaking Jews, widows who felt left out of this and they wanted to be taken care of. And so the apostles were being distracted from their work in the word and they determined to set out qualifications and tell these Christians to, based on these qualifications, choose seven men who meet these qualifications that you will set to this work. So notice in Acts 6 and verse 2, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's exactly what happened. But you notice there he says, These are the qualifications and inspired man speaking. And you choose them, you, you acknowledge them, you see who has these qualifications that we may appoint them. God's appointing them. God's appointing them through these qualifications. But certainly all of us have the duty to make sure those are observed in the man. Without bias, without agenda, but simply with the will of the Lord in mind. And so when we talk about qualifying men, men being qualified and then us appointing them, that's what we're talking about. God is doing this and we are complying and submitting to him. We need to realize that as we consider uh, putting a man into the office of the eldership. God's doing this by these qualifications. And so with that in mind, let's talk about the qualifications. As I mentioned, this will by no means be a deep and detailed study. Uh, you will see that there are many qualifications that are there. Many of you, obviously, are familiar with this. This study may be very new to some. I know that there have been recent converts within this congregation, and we're rejoicing with you, and we are praying to God that we can all grow together. There are some detailed studies that are available, and there are times and places where we would do that. But this is the time we have, and so we are going to have a cursory consideration of this. Remember, we need to understand these within the context of what they're qualifying a man for. And that's especially important when we get to the domestic qualifications. I've divided them into four sections of qualifications that pertain to the character of the man, the reputation of the man, his domestic relations, and his teaching aptitude. There are other divisions that have been made, and these are just simply ways of organizing them in our mind. These are the qualifications found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1. And what you'll see in those lists are some variations, but just like the four Gospels, they overlap, complement, and piece together show the agreement overall. And so Titus doesn't leave out things that uh, Paul or Paul doesn't leave out to Titus what he's put into Timothy and vice versa. He's using a very similar list, sometimes exact same words, to really give the entire same qualification. 
but it is our duty to hold fast the pattern of sound words and consider all of them together. So these are not in the order of Timothy qualifications and Titus qualifications, but they're mixed and separated into these categories. In 1 Timothy, we read that he must first desire the office. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. And I want to note that, that it is a work, an activity. These men are not figureheads and they're not do-nothingers. They are involved in a work. And, and when you might not be able to see all of the activity all of the time, don't doubt. They're working. And it's tough work. And it's stressful work. And we need to thank them for that. It's a good work and an important work. It's not an easy work, but it's a good work. And I think that's why the desire for the office is first and foremost. It's a difficult work. I have heard people say among my age group that, you know what, I don't even know if I want to be an elder because I don't know if I want to, to deal with what elders have to deal with. Well, if that's your attitude, you shouldn't be an elder. You're not qualified for it. And so it's a work of sacrifice. They need to desire the work. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, you remember, it says, Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. If someone is grabbing a man by the neck and putting him to the work against his will, how well do you think he's going to do? He must desire the work. In Titus, it gives the word hasios, and I'm not going to read all these uh, Greek words, by the way, but hasios is easy. Holy is the qualification. It is, as we often describe it, being set apart. It's undefiled by sin, Thayer says, free from wickedness, religiously observing every moral obligation, pure, holy, and pious. And so the idea would be separate from sin, but also consecrated positively to the work of the Lord. This man is living a moral life separate from sin, but not just an inactive life, but a life of positive righteousness, of doing the will of the Lord. Titus gives the qualification of just, which means equitable in character or act, Strong says. It also, by implication, means innocent and holy. And so you have the idea of being just in God's sight or righteous is a synonym of just. Well, holiness covers that. So it's likely that what the Holy Spirit is indicating by the word just is their dealings with other men. They are equitable in character or act. This is what Thayer says of being just rendering to each his due and that in a judicial sense, passing just judgment on others, whether expressed in words or shown by the manner of dealing with them. They're going to have to deal with brethren who are at odds with one another. When there is unfairness among the flock, they need to be fair in their judgment of it. They need to not make parties. They need to not make divisions and to be on the side of some people of the congregation, but against the other people. They need to be just and equal and equitable in their judicial uh, uh, work of making those judgments and decisions among the congregation. They're just men. We have all heard of unjust and uh, bought politicians. They're not just. Elders are to be just. They're to be gentle, which is a word that is one of those that is a struggle to find a an equipped word in the English to describe it, but it means, according to Thayer, seemingly suitable, equitable, fair, mild, or gentle. Vine says this of gentle. It expresses that considerateness that looks humanely and reasonably at the facts of a case. There's one uh, lexicon that describes it as sweet reasonableness. Arden Gingrich says it's yielding, gentle, kind, and courteous, tolerant. And so uh, an elder needs to be gentle, needs to have the ability to have compassion on a situation and not just be so strong-willed going into it, blind to the nuances of the people and of the situation and just thinking everyone's cut from the same cloth, every situation is the same, and just ramrodding every single thing. Another needs to be gentle. Another needs to be able to see, well, this person's a little different than this person over here, and I'm going to treat them accordingly. I, I want them to be saved, and so I'm not going to do something or act in such a way that would jeopardize their ability to repent or to grow in strength. And it would make sense in a situation like Jude mentions in Jude 22. On some have compassion, making a distinction. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. In First Thessalonians 5, it talks about how on some that you 
you, uh, you warn the, the, the unruly and you uphold the weak. And the, so there's differences of situations. Not everything's the same. Elder needs to be level-headed and equitable in their judgment of these things. They need to be of good behavior. That's the Greek word that is translated modest in First Timothy chapter 2 regarding the apparel of the Christian. But it is the Greek word cosmios, orderly, modest. R.C. Trench says that it's the well-ordering, not just of dress and demeanor, but of the inner life, uttering indeed and expressing itself in the outward conversation. Their character and their actions need to be fitting within the Word of God. They need to be men of good character and order according to the will of God. They need to be hospitable. It's a word that literally means a fond of strangers or guests. You can understand the word hospitable. It's meaning the same thing as the Greek word. It's where that we get our English word from, and we're very familiar with it. Why it would be important for an elder to entertain guests and to have that kind of warm relationship with people that are Christians visiting, but also with the congregation. They can know the flock in that way. An elder is to be a lover of what is good. In other words, he does not delight in sin and unholiness and darkness. He hates it. He does delight in the truth and in righteousness. 1 Corinthians 13 uses that kind of description with love. What is love? Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. He is to be temperate. In 1 Timothy, we see the qualification. And that means strictly holding no wine without wine a person sober, temperate, and abstinent. But Art and Gingrich says it pertains to being restrained in conduct, self-controlled, level-headed. Strong says it means to be sober and figuratively circumspect. And so it's, a, it's used literally, abstaining from wine. And we'll see that literally and not given to wine in the qualification after the next. And so temperate is likely referring to the fact of their circumspection, that they're serious, they're not foggy in their head, that they are sober and that they are aware and that they're able to think straight and they're level-headed, as Art and Gingrich says. And so as alcohol would lower inhibitions and a man doesn't think straight, he says things he wouldn't normally say, he does things he doesn't normally do, he's not thinking the way that he normally thinks, he's not governed, his inhibitions are lowered, well, there are other things that can take those away, distractions and cares and various things. An elder needs to be temperate. He needs to be self-controlled. We know what that means. You can't have an elder who is just doing whatever he wants at all times and is not restrained by the will of God. He needs to control himself by the will of God. Timothy and Titus both give the qualification, not given to wine. And it is a phrase with the word may, which is not. And then a word which means uh, staying near wine. It's a compound word, para oinos. Para, add or near, and oinos, wine. And we recently studied this in our lessons on alcohol. That means he's not even in the vicinity of wine. New American Standard Bible says not addicted to wine. And so this is the negative qualification where temperate would be the positive qualification. You're not near wine. It is not for elders to drink alcohol. Titus gives the qualification of not being quick-tempered. It is also a phrase, may, not, and or gilos, meaning inclined to anger, quick-tempered. Art and Gingrich quotes from Aristotle in his lexicon, and he says this, Aristotle said, quick-tempered persons, using this word, quick-tempered persons, lose no time being angry, and do so with those they ought not, over things they ought not, and far more than they ought. An elder needs to be in control of his temper. He needs to not have that temper out of control. He needs to be level-headed in heated situations. He needs to not be self-willed. Again, another phrase, not, and then a word which means to please self. Vine says, it denotes one who dominated by self-interest and inconsiderate of others, arrogantly asserts his own will. It would be what we read about in 1 Peter chapter 5, as he's lording it over the flock. He has authority, he has power, he knows it, and he's going to benefit from it his self an elder cannot be in it for himself an elder cannot be arrogantly asserting his own will but must be doing it in service of christ and the betterment of the flock and lastly with regard to character take a breath sober-minded is what timothy and titus both give so from but as sobriety would be literal certainly this word is used in the figurative sense the analytical lexicon of the Greek New Testament says it strictly has to do with the sound mind, a healthy mind, 
as having ability to curb desires and impulses so as to produce a measured and orderly life, uh, self-controlled, sensible. He needs to be having his senses together, to be clear-headed and to be serious about life, about service to Christ, and certainly about his work as an elder. We then get to a description of his reputation. Blameless is a uh, uh, qualification both Timothy and Titus give. Blameless as a steward, Titus says. And those two words are different, but they're synonyms. And it means literally that cannot be laid hold of, hence not open to censure, irreproachable. It's not saying that this man is perfect, but it's saying that there is nothing out there that he can be accused of. No one can point at something and say he's in sin, he's wrong. This man is blameless. No one can, can bring accusations against him. It doesn't mean no one will. But it means when they do, it holds no water. There's no evidence to it. Titus adds blameless as a steward. And so Patton in his commentary says, no charge of misconduct can be sustained against him in matters where trustworthiness is demanded. He must have a good testimony, Timothy says, or Paul says in Timothy's letter. Among those who are outside, testimony is an attestation of character or behavior. Testimony, a statement of approval. Those who are outside would be non-Christians, non-believers. And so he needs to even have a good reputation with the world so that the world cannot bring reproach upon the church through his tainted character and certainly cannot use that, Satan through that, to cause problems within the church, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil, First Timothy says. Also in First Timothy, he must not be quarrelsome. That means peaceable, pretty self-explanatory. He doesn't argue and cause strife. He's not envious. He's peaceable. He's not greedy for money, which would be the method of not being covetous. This phrase means not shamelessly greedy for money, avaricious, fond of dishonest gain. And so someone is covetous of money and then they get it by dishonest means, not through honest and legal means. And then he says not covetous in First Timothy to describe the attitude of loving money to valuing money above what is noble and good and of a spiritual nature, not covetous. And then lastly, he is not violent. It is a word which means, according to Strong, a smiter, pugnacious, quarrelsome. Thayer says, a bruiser ready for a blow. Elders cannot be this macho man who, who gets their pound of flesh and beats people up and is quick to fly off the handle. He's not a striker. He's a peacemaker. I want us to think about the domestic relations. Remember, we need to understand these within their context of what the work is that he's being qualified for. I know this is tedious and somewhat dry, but these are important. But there are many problems and debates which come in this realm. We don't have time to get into all of them. What I simply want to attempt to do is to just see what the qualification is as stated in the Scripture and deduct from that the obvious meanings from that text and I don't believe with the man being put forward any of the nuanced arguments and debates and considerations that a lot of opinionated people get into who are ignorant of the scriptures to be honest with you would even be a thing to apply in this situation but first Timothy and Titus both say he needs to be the husband of one wife so he's a man if a man desires the position of the bishop he is a married man But this precludes bigamy, having two wives, or polygamy, having multiple wives. This precludes one being a bachelor. He cannot work his way into this qualification. He needs to be married to one woman before he takes on the work of the eldership. But it also precludes adultery. And so he cannot be in a marriage that is not authorized. That is pretty simple, and we should keep it that way. He is one who, according to Timothy's letter that Paul wrote, rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reference. This would make sense since his job as an elder will be to rule. He rules his own house well. What has proven that he can rule effectively? He has ruled his house. But I want us to notice, as he's one who rules, exercises a position of leadership and authority to be at the head of someone or something, that he has shown he can rule his own house well, not rule his neighbor's house, and not rule those who have left his house. That's important. That's one of the hang-ups that people have. 
In Genesis 2 and verse 24, it talks about how a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And when that happens, they make a new home. They leave mother and father. You cannot rule over someone who is not under your rule. That's the point. He is one who has ruled his own house and he's done it well. That is, effectively, and it goes on to say, having his children in submission. They are not rebellious toward their father. They respect their father. They do what their father says. They are in submission to their father. But then it says, with all reverence. You might have the English Standard Version. And this is how it translates the verse. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. The dignity or reverence is in respect to and descriptive of the man who is ruling his own house. It is a word, according to the analytical lexicon of the Greek New Testament, that means as serious and worthy conduct that earns reverence and respect, dignity, seriousness, propriety. He is leading his household with gravity. He understands the importance of it. He understands what's at stake. He is not relaxed in his approach, but is sober and serious in his approach to such a degree that he has earned the dignity and respect from his family. That's important. And I want us to notice the reason he gives there in 1 Timothy 4, in parentheses in the New King James Version, if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? That makes sense, doesn't it? If his whole house is in disorder and his children are rebellious, he does not have a, a reign on them, how in the world is he going to exercise authority with a flock of souls? Makes sense, doesn't it? The home is his testing ground and his proving ground. And with such a faithful family, he has proved himself. Titus adds it this way, though. He has faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Another one of the areas of debate. The word faithful, pistos, is used throughout the New Testament in reference to Christians, those who are believers, those who are faithful to God, those who are faithful to Christ. They are disciples of Christ. The ASV translates it this way, having children that believe. And I want us to think about this for a second. We can't go into detail about it. But remember the context of this. If he does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? How will he lead the church of God spiritually in faithfulness? It makes sense that this faithful describes a child who is obedient to the gospel, who is a child of God, who is a Christian, a baptized believer, because he has led them spiritually in that truth to make that important decision to give their lives to Jesus in holy discipleship and service. If that can happen within his home, he has proven that he can lead spiritually within the church. After all, Ephesians 6 and verse 4 tells us that fathers are to raise their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's what they'll be doing with the congregation. Therefore, those children are not to be accused of dissipation. That is a dissolute, immoral life, debauchery, dissipation, incorrigibility. They must not be insubordinate, lacking obedience and self-control and, and submission to authority. And lastly, I want us to think about his teaching aptitude. In 1 Timothy, it says that the elder must be able to teach. It is a word which means apt and skillful in teaching. Again, this is a relative term. There are some who are better teachers than others. But can he teach and can he do it effectively? I think that we can all teach effectively to a certain degree with those who are lost. If you know he who believes and is baptized will be saved and he who does not believe will be condemned, you can effectively teach that to someone else. But this man has been learned in the doctrine of Christ entirely and has been able to show that he can study, come to an understanding, and convey that meaning to others in an effective way. He must hold fast the faithful word as he has been taught in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, you remember that the Apostle Paul told the elders there to take heed to yourselves. Similar to what Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. He told young men in Titus 2 and verse 7, in doctrine show integrity. He needs to be faithful himself. He needs to be aware of himself and willing to hold to God's will no matter what. Stand for the truth in his own life. He's proven that. He holds fast to the faithful word. He holds it firmly. He cleaves to it to the extent that he's able to exhort others. 
which means to admonish them or encourage them and urge them to pursue some course of conduct. He's trying to get the congregation to pursue the course of the New Testament. He's able to convict, refute, and confute those who contradict, Titus says in that letter. Paul says to Titus, and we read about that importance. And then lastly, in this regard, he is not to be a novice. Strong defines the word as newly planted, as a young convert. And he gives this reason, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Can you imagine someone obeys the gospel and the next Sunday we put them forward as an elder? How much time have have they had to to know God's word, to be transformed into the the humble service of, of Christ? Not much time. Would they be prone to pride in a place of leadership? That's what he's saying. It must not be a new convert. They are one who has had years of experience. I know that that was very fast and probably a blur. I'll give you my outline if you want it. Just ask me. But those are the qualifications. And if the man fits that, then he is to be appointed. We're not going to go into this in much detail because that did not permit us. Perhaps we'll have another uh, lesson before long with more detail about this. But I want us to think about this. In First Peter 5, he writes to the elders who are among you. Among this congregation, there are certain men who have been appointed and qualified, who are serving Christ first and foremost, and using their authority vested by Christ to the benefit spiritually of this congregation. It is an important work. It's a serious work. It's a difficult work. It's a stressful work. It is a God-ordained work. And we need to have the proper attitude toward it. And we need to make sure we're fulfilling our responsibilities. In 1 Peter chapter 5, it speaks of humility in that realm. Elders in verse 5, the antecedent is the office of the elder. And it would be likely a possibility for younger people to have this problem with insubordination and a failure for respect for authority. And he tells them you need to submit. And that requires humility is what he says there. They need to be honored, as the prayer was said earlier. They need to be esteemed highly, but notice, in love for their work's sake. And so you've heard of the description when we think about politics, that you respect the office, not necessarily the man. Well, you need to respect the man but you're esteeming them highly for their work's sake. Their work, the office itself, is worthy of that honor and respect. 1 Timothy 5 talks about them being worthy of double honor to the extent that even literally they are worthy of pay. That happened in the first century especially, but they are worthy of our utmost veneration. We need to know them. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 12 tells us, We know those who rule among you, who work among you, who labor among you. You need to know those men. And I want us to think about this. They need to know the flock. But this is putting the onus on us. And so there are some, what we might describe as high-maintenance Christians who are just thinking selfishly about themselves. Oh, I'm not getting enough attention paid me. You need to reach out and get to know the elders. You need to visit with the elders. You need to take that initiative. That's what the Bible's telling us here. You need to get to know them. You need to get to know them so you can imitate them, Hebrews 13 and in verse 7, whose faith follow. They are the ideal Christian. They are mature Christian. They aren't perfect, but they have shown themselves to be imitators of Christ. And as Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ, so we are to imitate the elders as they imitate Christ. You are to be submissive. And to obey, and I want us to notice there, I want to actually read that briefly. In Hebrews 13 and verse 17, the Hebrew writer says, Obey those who rule over you. Who rules over any congregation? It's the elders, the overseers, the bishops, the pastors, the shepherds. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. We obey them as they hold fast to the word and they hold us accountable. And as they make judgments within their authority to do so, we obey them. But notice, For they watch out for your souls. They're not in it for themselves. They're in it for your benefit. And we need to view them as such and obey them. Notice in verse 17, as well as those who must give account. And then as we see the next word, the the next thought, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. 
it is already a stressful and difficult work before someone makes it difficult for them. When there are Christians who cannot be satisfied and cannot get along and they're doing all things, contrary to Philippians 2.14, with complaining and disputing, it's making their work all the more difficult. It should be a rewarding work. Difficult, but a rewarding work. It should be a joyous thing. And it's up to us to stay at peace among ourselves, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 13, to be living the righteous life, to be seeking and pursuing righteousness no matter what, always working our best to imitate Christ and to uphold their hands as they are seeking to serve Christ and us in this capacity. And lastly, James chapter 5 and verse 14, speaking of illness, it says, Call for the elders of the church that they may pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And while that's true for physical illness, it should be true for anything. They're there in service to God and to the congregation. They're there for our help for our aid, for our guidance, and we need to reach out to them. Brethren, the elders are mature spiritual men who have met the qualifications that the Holy Spirit has set forth, but they're not mind readers. They're not flawless psychologists who can discern all the personality traits of each individual in the congregation and know exactly what you need and when you need it and can be right on top of it that way. Call on them. Go to them for help. If you've got a problem and it is within the context of going to the elders, if it's not, you need to go to your brother, whatever it may be. But if you need their help, that's what they're there for. We need to hold them in high esteem and respect them in that way and use them because that's what they're there for by the gracious will of God. I know that was a laborious study and I apologize for the time, but it was necessary And I hope that it was clarifying. And if it wasn't, you can talk to me about it or others. I certainly can give you my outline if you would so desire it. If anyone here is wanting to obey the gospel this afternoon, we want to give you the opportunity to do so. We don't know how much time we have, so don't hesitate and don't put this off for another time. If there's any spiritual need we can assist you with, come forward while we stand and sing.